I, I loved The Last Talk. Science fiction is one of the places, actually movies for me is one of the places where I always look and feel extremely jealous how easy it is to create an image of a robot and how difficult it is for us in our lab to get anywhere close to that. Um, so, um, but in addition to science fiction, there's also other sources of inspiration. And sometimes just nature itself seems stranger than science fiction. So I wanted to start with two uh, examples of things that I find uh, inspiring in my own work. One which I discovered as a graduate student, or one source of inspiration which I discovered as a graduate student, and one that I thought about more um, after becoming a, a faculty member. And those are just collective intelligence, how groups of very, very simple individuals can come together and do amazing things. And when we think of ourselves as people, and you think, what could you know, a thousand people get together and do, probably chaos comes to mind. <laughs> Um, confusion comes to mind. You think, OK, we need somebody in charge, uh, somebody who can tell everyone else what to do. But when you look at nature, there are lots of examples where that's not true at all, where um, lots of individuals are cooperating, but it's not clear if there's a leader or if anyone is in charge. So the two examples that I have here have to do um, with cells as a cooperation and termites or insects as a cooperation. So on the left, you have a starfish. Um, which you could think of as a collection of cells, all of the cells having the same identical program. And somehow these cells get together and self-organize into this complicated structured organism that can live and breathe and eat and take care of itself. And on the right-hand side, you have these huge termite mounds, um, which are built by tiny centimeter scale insects that again collaborate to create this large-scale structure that internally has a nest and and um, fungus gardens and a respiratory system, almost as if it was a large-scale version of the body of a starfish. And what's even more incredible about both of these things is how they can repair. So if you cut off the leg of a starfish, most starfish can actually regenerate um, in amazing ways. If you cut off the top of a termite mound, the termites will fix it as well. So these systems just seem to be incredibly complex, made by tiny little individuals who cooperate to create it. And of course, if you look through nature, this is just one of many, many examples that you can think of where we see this kind of collective behavior. And this is different from thinking about humans as robots, but thinking of um, many, many simpler individuals as robots. So as a biologist, of course, these are fascinating. This is you know, one of the key aspects of life, is how this kind of cooperation becomes so powerful. But as a computer scientist, you could look at this in the same way, because we would like to build systems that are complex, are able to do complicated tasks, and it would be nice if we could build them as, in this way by building simpler um, pieces that could then cooperate. And of course, we do this in computer networking, but can we do this in robotics? So just as a, as a motivation, whether or not we know how to program these systems, we certainly are going to be building them, and we're building them already. Whether we think of agriculture, or we think of search and rescue, or we think of uh, looking through the environment, or we think of warehouses and, um, and robots that look like multicellular beings, in all of these cases, the vision is the same, that we build a lot of pieces, and those pieces can collaborate. And almost every application that you might think of in robotics, um, whether it's agriculture or um, search and rescue, you're not going to make the one perfect robot that's going to slowly move through the world and do everything perfectly. You're always going to have many robots. So understanding how to create multiple robots that cooperate is just going to be an essential piece of robotics. Uh, so in my, in my lab, we, we work mostly um, on this problem of how do we create collective intelligence? How do we create collections of individuals that can cooperate to do things? Um, and the, the arrows go both ways. So if I create a system where individuals are doing particular things, I'd like to be able to reason about the group, that the group is going to actually achieve what I care about. And vice versa, it would be nice if I could just say what I wanted to achieve, put it into some kind of compiler, and magically produce what the rules are that the individuals could run. So this would sort of be like saying, you know, I can look at the rules of the termite, and I can reason about why they build the mounds that they do. Or alternatively, I could put in the style of mound I want, and perhaps compile out what the termites should be doing in order to achieve that kind of structure. So how do we link those two pieces together? Um, so we look at this uh, 
idea from many different directions. We look at it from a purely theoretical idea. Um, how do we have abstract agents that cooperate? What kinds of mathematical tools allow us to reason about these systems? Uh, we build different kinds of robots, as Sabine said, to, to test out this idea. Uh, and we also um, work with biologists to try and understand uh, the very systems that we like to study. So today I'm going to talk only about one particular project uh, that Sabine alluded to, but basically coming from the idea of termites. Termites as an inspiration. So as I said before, you know, these termites are centimeter scale insects, but they build these really complicated large mounds, and the mounds have a lot of internal structure. Um, what's really interesting is that social insect construction is one of the places where people have thought a lot about coordination. What kinds of coordination allow the insects to do this? Um, and the belief is that they actually do it in a completely decentralized way. That there, there is a queen, but the queen is not actually telling any of the individual what, what to do. Each individual is moving through the mound, finding places where things need to be built, and building. And somehow this allows a huge amount of parallelism where a million termites can actually function together because they don't need to go consult the one mega termite who's going to make sure everybody's doing the right thing. Instead, they can all do things in parallel. Uh, if some of them die, it doesn't matter. Um, they can make a very complex structure, even though individually they probably don't know what the state of the mound is. So somehow these social insects can achieve three really important things, parallelism, robustness, and complexity, but by exploiting the fact that they're actually decentralized. So the question is, could we do the same with robots? Right, so we like to build structures, uh, lots of different structures. Sometimes we like to build structures that we want, that are beautiful. Other times we're building structures for functional reasons. Sometimes we're building structures in emergencies. So all of these different cases, there are many reasons why you could think about. Um, imagine a world where robots could do this. We could put down a bunch of robots, explain to them the thing that was needed to be built, and they would cooperate. And what if it could be like the termites, that I don't have to make sure I have exactly the right number of robots. Um, maybe if a few of them have to go recharge, it doesn't cause any problems. And if I throw more robots at the problem, it just goes faster. Right? That somehow I could have a system like the termites is both robust and parallel and made of individuals that are seemingly a lot simpler than the task that they're trying to solve. So this is sort of the vision uh, behind the idea. Um, so I'm going to show an abstract model of how you might go about doing this. Um, but of course, this is just one abstraction. There are many ways you could think about this problem. Uh, so I don't want to say this is the only way to think about it, but it's one way to think about it if you care about decentralized systems, systems where individuals are interacting. So imagine that you, had, uh, you started out with a bunch of robots and a bunch of blocks, and you gave them a picture. And what you want to say is, here's the picture, go build. And you don't know exactly how many robots they are. Maybe they don't know either. But the point is, they go and start to collect blocks. They come to the structure. They go around, and they start to build. Um, but each robot maybe is much smaller than the structure they're trying to build, so they can't really see very much. They don't know what's going on with the other robots that are further away. So, um, so we start with this abstract model where we have these simple robots. They all have identical rules. Um, they have very local sensing in action. Uh, and there's no supervisor, and there's no talking amongst the robots. So sort of just taking the ideas from, from what we assume termites are doing and trying to say, can we work within this system? And the question is, you know, if we are allowed to set the rules, could they coordinate to build the structure that we want? And can we automate the process of making those rules? Obviously, if we can't coordinate to build the structure we want, then there's nothing to automate. So hopefully we solve the first one first. Um, so we can for many different kinds of structures that you would like or care about. And it really works by combining two sets of ideas. One set of ideas comes from the social insects, how they coordinate without talking. And the other set of ideas comes from thinking about self-assembly, so a completely different uh, set of how you would build structures. OK, so I'm just going to describe those two, two ideas. So the first is thinking of collective construction as tile self-assembly. So tile self-assembly has a really long history um, within computer science, going back to thinking about cellular automata, modeling things like how corals form. So you can imagine that you have things floating around, and they attach to each other in crystals form. So from the earliest days, 
you know, we have thought about self-assembly. Um, even all the way up to now, so DNA self-assembly thinks of, of pieces that float around and attach to each other and create complex structure. So there's a really big world of thinking about tile self-assembly. So if you squint your eyes for a minute and forget that they were robots, and imagine that the world just had tiles that are floating around, then I basically, for self-assembly, am asking two key questions. Here's my little tile, and the tile comes and arrives at this point, and the tile has a decision to make. Should it, should it attach? That's basically the decision. And so what could make it decide to attach? Well, it wants to attach because it wants to build the right structure, but also, it, if it doesn't attach correctly, it might create a problem that is difficult to solve later. So just to show you some examples of problems, uh, you could have tiles attached that really aren't correct to begin with. You could have tiles attach and basically leave a blank that can no longer be filled, so like defects in a crystal. Um, you could also maybe create structures that aren't defects, but they're really hard to fix. So here's an example where to fix this, I have to shove a little tile in between two tiles. That might be something difficult to do. So there are lots of things that this tile somehow has to be able to figure out and avoid. Um, and if there are many tiles coming from many different directions, this can get more complicated because as I'm making a decision, the structure itself continually is changing. Okay, so we can solve this with two pieces. First one is if you imagine the tiles were active, that a tile could actually remember something about its state. Then I can imagine that I colored my picture in a way where everything has a different color and so a tile can come up and basically locally look at the states of the tiles and decide what it should be. So this is the idea of having a coordinate system. A coordinate system is a really powerful idea because if I know my coordinate and I, if I look at things next to and ahead of me in the coordinate system, I can actually know where I am in a global sense without actually measuring anything far away. Right? So coordinate system is actually a way in which we turn global information into local information. So I can do that in this system if my tiles could actually actively store state. So this tile comes up, it can read the values on this tile, and then it can join uh, and take on an appropriate value. And for many structures, you don't have to build coordinate systems. You can get away with a lot less state. Um, but I'm just going to use coordinate systems. It's a simple case. OK, but this still doesn't prevent you from doing bad things like attaching and making a hole. So the second interesting idea is that you can have certain rules that prevent bad things from happening, like um, defects. And this actually turns out to be really important for all kinds of lattice systems. So here's just one example of something we call the row, row rule, which is basically if I wanted to make a rectangle um, in the structure, then I should never create this intermediate structure because I'm going to create this gap. And no matter how I place tiles now, I'm going to end up with trying to squish a tile between two other tiles. And in addition, this kind of structure very easily leads to holes and gaps. So if I just avoid this, where I always build rows and columns kind of contiguously in my structure, then I can actually avoid all kinds of future problems by avoiding this one simple local problem. So we can sort of um, find these invariants for certain kinds of structures that allow us to say, if you avoid these local ideas, then in fact you will never create defects that propagate throughout the whole structure. So it's not always easy to find these invariants, so we can find these invariants only for certain classes of structures. But once you combine these two tiles that can store state and invariants that prevent you from building bad things, you can actually reason quite a bit about self-assembly. So our group, many other groups, uh, people in DNA as self-assembly, have produced compilers where for classes of shapes, you can basically push in the picture and out pops the tile attachment rules. And the really cool thing about these tile attachment rules is that you can many times prove that they will work, and you'll prove even though the tiles act in any order. So all of a sudden, a whole level of coordination has gone away. The tiles don't have to make sure that they come in the right order. They can kind of roam around in different ways. Um, but they're actually guaranteed to build the correct structure. So this is the first piece of the puzzle. Uh, and there are lots of interesting mathematics about you know, what's the best way of making these rules, or the fastest rules, or the most robust rules, or rules that allow attachment and detachment. The second piece is we don't actually have tiles. <laughs> we have robots, and the robots are moving around tiles. So now, how do we turn the behavior of a tile self-assembly system into a robot system that cooperates? So here we can use an idea from social insects uh, called stigmergy, 
trying to make sure I'm on time. All right. Um, where insects coordinate by using the environment. So the idea is that the, the idea behind Stigmergy is that rather than me talking to other people in the environment, I can go, I observe the environment and decide to do something to it. But once I've done something to it, I change what someone else is going to observe. And in that way, I have actually performed an act of communication. So as people, we do this actually all the time. And one of the key ways we leave information in the environment is actually we leave office numbers. Right? We mark our environment with office numbers all the time. That's a way of leaving a piece of, a piece of information in the environment that is really important for that location. In building, termites and other insects use this quite a bit. So I can look at the configuration of um, the patterns of things built around me to decide what to build next. I can even lay pheromones to say, OK, this is a place where building needs to happen or what kinds of building needs to happen. So in this way, um, by using the environment as a communication method, termites are actually termites, wasps, uh, many insects are very good at collaborating in, um, in construction. And of course, we do it as well. So if we go back to the robots, the robots can use the things that they build as a form of communication. So I can look at the patterns of blocks that have been built already if I were the robot. Um, potentially, I could also leave information on the block. So for example, if the blocks had RFID tags, then I could leave more information in the blocks. So now, by using these blocks, we can actually encode state. OK. So one of the, one of the interesting things is this actually makes self-assembly look like a continuum. So imagine a case where I have blocks that are like bricks. I can leave no information. And in fact, I can have individuals that only interact with patterns and have to do a little bit more with memory. So I have smart individuals and inert blocks. All the way to the other extreme, where my blocks are like cells. They can communicate with each other, but my robots know nothing. They just go around shoving blocks next to each other and have no idea of the pattern. So in fact, a whole spectrum of possibilities um, arise when you want to build the system as to where the information resides. So this is interesting because it gives us more scope of what kinds of robots we can build, but also more different kinds of structures that we can imagine to create. So this is just uh, some examples of different kinds of structures that we can build compilers for. So in each of these cases, the picture is drawn, put into a program, and the program spits out the rules. Um, the tiles come in any order. These ones really look like tiles coming in any order. This is an example of 3D shapes. We can do certain kinds of 3D shapes. It's actually fairly more complicated. This is a, a recent example um, looking at shapes where the robots have certain other constraints, like they can't fly through space without gravity. Um, they actually have to build uh, staircases and maintain staircases through the structure in order to build the structure that they want. So in all of these cases, we can actually now sort of produce, do that global to local transformation of creating compilers. But again, you know, all of these exploit similar ideas, but as you change the constraints on the system, you still have to invent new ways and new constraints and invariants for thinking about it. OK, so that's the theory part of it. How do we build robots that can do this? So um, if we look at termites, one of the other sort of really fascinating things is how large structures they can build. So if you think about these tiny little termites, they can build things that are just incredibly large compared to their own size. And one of the things they do is they climb over the structures they build and carry the materials. So if I want to get higher, I just have to build myself something that gets me higher. And that's basically how I'm going to work. So could we make robots that could build structures larger than themselves? And of course, as we learned recently, some robots can. So these are computer scientists who got to this problem well before I did and solved it and created a robot that builds. And it builds by finding materials in the environment, making it into little blocks, and then making staircases and towers that it can climb up to make them larger and larger. So imagine that we could build robots of this kind. Um, obviously, that's actually pretty hard because it combines many things that we still don't do well with robots. Um, you know, it has to climb over uh, the structures that it builds. Climbing is still a challenge for many of us. Uh, it has to carry while climbing. So manipulation is also yet a big challenge in robotics. And lastly, it has to sense the local configuration. So if I'm building a large structure, I'm in this complicated environment. I'm separated, occluded from other robots. I have to be able to make whatever decisions I make with whatever I'm able to sense. Um, 
and that may be very limited. So how do we get the system to work? So in the sensing side, we can take some advantage from the kinds of algorithms I discussed. But on the building side, we still have to build these structures. So recently, we started a project. <laughs> I shouldn't say recently. It's been a while. Um, called the Termes Robots um, that try to do each of these pieces. So locomotion, navigation, manipulation, and finally coordination, these four pieces. So the robots use these specialized wheels to do locomotion. They can climb over structures, not as good as the termites, but they can climb up staircases. So as long as they're staircases, they can um, climb. They can also, as they move around the world, sense what they're doing. So they use ultrasound uh, to measure their distance from the structure, and that allows them to navigate around or wall follow a structure. Once they're on a structure, they can look at the patterns on the structure um, using uh, color sensors and basically reason about whether they're going up or down with accelerometers. And in this way, they can traverse both on the structure and off the structure. Next challenge, of course, is manipulation. So they have a, a very simple gripper that uses just one actuator to both pick up, to grab and pick up and drop blocks. Um, so the idea is that it has a torsional surge spring gripper that automatically opens when it um, moves its arm down. So here's an example of the robot sort of moving over a structure. It's carrying a block, uses the structure to help itself align. As you can see, it actually doesn't do all of its actions correctly. In fact, this is one of the, the major aspects of this robot. Um, it constantly uses different kinds of sensors to correct and improve the way that it's doing something. So it tries to realign. It tries to try again. Here's another example where it doesn't have to place it on the structure, but it has to place it off the structure. It's a little more complicated because there's less um, cues to work off of. But in case you saw, it sort of jiggles it uh, in place. Um, so once you have locomotion, navigation, the ability to pick up and carry blocks, you actually have a fairly capable individual. And so this is just showing the single robot climbing up a fairly complicated structure, making sure it doesn't fall off, um, knowing when it arrived through the structure and where it has to actually place a block. And once it's built and placed this block, it can actually climb over the very structure that it built. OK. So the next step, of course, is to get multiple robots working together. And the nice part about you know, the previous algorithms I showed is that the robots can work together um, in a decentralized way. So we take a structure and we put it through a compiler to generate rules. But what this compiler does is it actually generates traffic patterns. So imagine a structure that just has sort of roads through it that says the robots should move this way through the structure. Each of the robots gets that information and also has internal rules. And so the internal rules of the robot are basically the tile self-assembly rules from before. Don't build, build rows of things contiguously. Um, Build things in the form of staircases. Don't build yourself cliffs that you can't get off of. So every structure sort of is a growing staircase of some kind. But the key thing is that each of the robots is independently building these structures. So the structure may form in many ways. We can even make structures that are different each time. So here's an example showing the robot implementing, uh, a single robot implementing the algorithm. So it walks around the structure, looks for the starting location, takes a block, which is supplied by us, uh, and builds the structure. And the key idea is that every time it goes around to the structure, it has no memory of what it did in the past. In fact, each time it comes to the structure, it's just doing it anew. It's just looking for a place to build and building that structure. And this is what allows it to cooperate with many other robots without knowing how many they are, because maybe other robots came and built part of the structure already, which is fine, because the robot can come and just complete the structure or whatever is not there. Or maybe some of the structure disappeared, and it had to come back and fix it. So here's the final, um, the final system altogether. So we have these individual robots, our three, um, three builder robots. They come along, pick up uh, blocks, walk around the structure looking for a place to build. And they just continually do these actions, uh, completely using sensing from the structure and sensing around the structure. And the only coordination is waiting. So you can see an example here where this robot is waiting for the other one to get around. So the only thing they talk to each other is yelling at other ones to stay away, just avoid. Um, but this is sufficient for these robots to actually do what might seem like way too complicated to do when individuals can't talk. And so I think for us, this was a, a really big advance where we could make 
robots that were fully autonomous um, that can execute the kinds of algorithms that we think we can build. Um, so it was very exciting. But at the same time, you know, this is a really simple structure compared to what we as humans can build. So there's still a really big gap between this research and where we would want to be. Um, I'm going to wrap up fairly quickly. Okay. All right. Um, so what, would, what could we do next? Well, you know, maybe we could have robots that moved around beams and made roofs, and now we could make multi-story structures. Or maybe we could have robots with better sensing so that they could operate outdoors. Or, or maybe we could think of completely different ways of thinking about um, construction. So if we look at the animal world, you know, termites are just one kind of construction. Birds are an amazing example. They build with mud, they build with sticks, they fly into the structure and place things. Um, beavers build out of found objects and cut them to the size that they want and put these pieces together. It's just really amazing how many different forms of construction they are. And of course, there are many different needs of construction. So we haven't even scratched the surfaces. What kinds of robots would we want to build? And there are really amazing examples from other labs that are interested in the same problem, thinking of construction totally differently. So for example, uh, from ETH, um, helicopters, or sorry, quad rotors, that are basically building, kind of like birds building a nest together, uh, building large scale structures. Maybe we could build climbing structures out of trusses where individuals climb uh, over an open structure. Uh, and in our lab, we're looking at robots that build out of compliant materials. So actually building in a messy world with messy materials, uh, maybe more like the animals do, and creating structures that are functionally important even if they're not exactly the correct structure. So I think there's just really this big area for us of thinking about different kinds of, of construction and different kinds of complex behavior. Um, and finally, you know, building or you know, termites are doing this is just one kind of complex behavior. Is it possible to make compilers for other things? Like, could I say, I have a colony. Here's the environment of robots. I'm putting it in this environment. I want to put it in a compiler, come out with agent rules that make them survive. That would be amazing, right? Where you could actually compile out the behavioral program of something that had to solve a really complicated program, which may involve building and searching and all kinds of other things. So I think there's really still a lot to learn in this global to local transformation. All right, and just to um, the final slide, everything I've talked about is itself the product of collective intelligence. Um, so the work I presented uh, here has been done in collaboration with Justin Werfel, who's been a longtime collaborator of mine, uh, Kirsten, who really brought the robots to life. And I didn't have much time to talk about Niels, but he's working, um, as I said, we're trying to build robots that don't build uh, out of fixed materials, but build out of really messy uh, and crazy materials. And of course, we have a lab of really fun uh, people who are always thinking of new and creative ways of making robots and sometimes succeeding. <laughs> That's it.